Episode 96, The Paradox. Welcome to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. Welcome to The Paradox. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Larson. Thank you for joining me as we explore the U.S. medical system in a fun and informative format through expert analysis. Today's expert is, again, Dr. David Graham. He's an infectious disease specialist in Billings, Montana, and we're going to discuss COVID-19 because that's just kind of what everyone's discussing right now, especially as schools start to reopen, both colleges, secondary schools, and elementary schools. It's something we need to address and focus on again. We talked about herd immunity last week, and so today's sort of a continuation of that discussion. We're going to take the principles we learned yet last week on, on how the current uh, scientific community is coming to a consensus that probably herd immunity is much less than the 60-80% that's often cited. What it really is, whether it's 20%, 10%, 40%, somewhere in between, we're not sure, but it's probably lower than what we had originally thought. Uh, also, and how that changes our strategy and what vaccinations r- will play. But really, the point of the discussion today, we're going to discuss COVID-19 and the transition. So Dr. Graham wrote a piece, which will be found at the show notes page at theparadox.com slash 096. I'd highly recommend you go read it. It's very short and straight to the point. And it just discusses the thought experiment of what what we're doing from here until this pandemic ends. And the transition phase is we have to go from COVID-19 being something that's a deadly killer to something where it becomes the common cold. Now, from an evolutionary standpoint, our suspicion is that the other coronaviruses that exist are the same and that they uh, became endemic, meaning they're always present, and that at one time they probably caused significant problems when they were first introduced into humans. Uh, Maybe not, or certainly maybe not as severe. We don't really know exactly how long they are. There's suspicion that the flu of the late 1880s or 90s that was called the Russian flu was quite possibly a coronavirus. We're going to talk today about what that transition phase is going to look like. What can we really do? Can we get rid of this disease? What are reasonable expectations for how this thing ends? Can we reasonably eradicate coronavirus? And I think after the end of this show, you'll come to the conclusion, I hope, much like we did, that there is no eradication of COVID-19, that we're going to have to learn how to live with this. And even with a vaccine, people are going to continue to get coronavirus. This is not something that we should be entirely saddened by. It's something that obviously we wish we didn't have. It was not the case. But it's probably the likely outcome for all this. And so this is not even going to address the policy considerations, the fact that, you know, at some point life has to continue, even in the face of the coronavirus being existent and endemic within the population. But anyway, that's a discussion for another day. Today we're just going to sort of talk about the evidence for that, the actual progression for from pandemic to endemic. And I hope you'll get a good feel for where we're headed and hopefully some hope that this is not going to be something that's going to be crippling for us for years to come. As I've mentioned a few times already, I'd recommend you go to theparadox.com slash 096. There you can get links to show notes from other coronavirus episodes we've done. Also, my previous discussion with Dr. Graham, where we talked about back in April, when we knew a lot less than we do now. And also the show notes page, which will have the specific paper that he alludes to here. uh, And that I think, again, I highly recommend that you read. If you're so inclined, I'd appreciate it if you go to the Patreon page at patreon.com slash the paradox. There you can find ways to support the show. Even a pledge of $2 a month is greatly appreciated. It helps defray the cost for the, putting on the episode as it is time and expense with the computers, microphones, websites, hosting services, and the like. But even if you don't financially support the show, I would greatly appreciate you going to your podcast player that you're using right now. And go and leave a rating. Written reviews are always uh, appreciated. And leave a five-star rating. And also make sure you subscribe to the show if you've not already. And please share it with a friend. I've had an unprecedented growth the last few weeks of the show, and I can contribute that only to you. And unfortunately, probably the subject matter of COVID-19, that's on everyone's mind. But the fact that we're getting such a great response from the show uh, is really a testament to your listenership and the fact that you're sharing with your friends. And I greatly appreciate that. And uh, I don't know how to thank you enough. The 
that we can get this word out and spread the message that we're um, working on with this show. So without further ado, it's a little bit longer discussion, but I think it's really good. But without further ado, Dr. David Graham, an infectious disease specialist in Billings, Montana, discussing COVID-19 from pandemic to endemic. How do we get there? Enjoy. Well, hi, this is Eric again. I'm here with my good friend, Dr. David Graham. He's an infectious disease specialist from Billings, Montana, actually originally from Michigan, but now in Billings, Montana. And we spoke on episode 86. We're going to go once again and delve into COVID. He's the author of the FI Physician or Financial Independence Physician website. You can visit that at fiphysician.com. And we last spoke in April 28th, which, boy, you know, feels like about three years ago, Dave. <laughs> I can't believe it. Yeah. What has happened since then? Almost nothing. Yeah, right. And I feel like about two weeks from now, everything we talk about could be completely obsolete or changed. But, you know, looking over the conversation we had then, we were talking about how this pandemic ends. And I think we're going to sort of talk about this because you wrote a piece recently, which I thought was really good, sort of the transition, the, you know, where we are now to how we get to the point where we think this is virus is going to go. So we'll discuss that. But um, why don't you briefly just tell us a little bit about what's going on in Montana? You know, you're in a rural area, and so you're not in the place anyone talks about when it comes to COVID in the, in the media. So what are things like out where you are? Yeah, so we really didn't have much of a first wave at all. Uh, in fact, I wrote a blog about flattening the line, um, which we did really <laughs> well. We, we, we got that line pretty darn flat, let me tell you. Um, but then, you know, we reopened. And like a lot of people, uh, when we reopened, we started seeing some more cases. So, you know, in Montana, we've got about 10 per 100,000 new cases uh, every day. And, you know, the United States is around 15, somewhere around there. So we're still low incidence. Um, we've had some bad nursing home um, um, uh, effects and some deaths. And like everyone, we're just trying to struggle through until um, we get the, the magic cure, as the press and the president <laughs> like to tell us, right? Right. Yeah, and that was actually you, – you began your piece by saying that the president says this is going to end. And I so – and and I in some ways, I feel like it's a lot like the joke about hemorrhaging, right? Like bleeding. Like eventually ble all bleeding stops, right? That's like the old medical joke, right? That's Whether right. you stop yeah. it or you just bleed to death, you know? So um, let's talk about – let's talk about COVID, obviously. And let's talk – and I should be specific to say COVID-19 because there are other coronaviruses that we could be talking about. But so obviously we're talking about COVID-19. Explain to us um, what it is about that about COVID nineteen that lends you to say that it's impossible to eradicate. So maybe maybe to back up, what does it take to eradicate a virus, and how successful have we been in the past? Yeah, yeah. So that you know, you made the comment early. Maybe what we're going to be talking about two weeks from now is totally different, and I don't think so. I I think that we can actually use medical theory rather than the give and take of actual science on the ground right now to conclude a lot of things about COVID. So we can look at um, evolutionary biology. We can look at, you know, fundamentals of what does it take to eradicate a virus? And we can understand a whole heck of a lot of what the next two to five years um, are going to look like. And, you know, frankly, with or without a vaccine, with or without a therapeutic, this all ends the same. This all ends with an endemic coronavirus. So, but let's start at the beginning. You know, why is this not going to be eradicated? If you look at what it takes to eradicate a virus, well, first of all, you have to have uh, no non-human hosts. So no reservoir species. And that actually is pretty likely with uh, COVID-19 that there isn't a reservoir species. So it came from bats. We know that we can't really find that bat that it came from. Um, and then it's been in, what, dogs, pigs, cats, tigers, but those are hopefully dead-end species. So hopefully, even if we get rid of this, like New Zealand did, hopefully it won't come back on the back of a, a, a tiger <laughs> or a, a house cat. So there is no reservoir species that we know about. So um, um, SARS-CoV-2 is eradicatable based upon that criterion. Um, the next criteria, uh, however, is that um, is that you actually have to have a, a, a way to get rid of it. You have to reach immunity against it such that it stops transmitting. And I think that's really where the 
the fallout happens is that, you know, Fauci says even at the best or, or they would accept a vaccine with 50 to 60 percent um, efficacy. Right. So that it it evokes an immune response in 50 to 60 percent of the people. But frankly, if we look at the other coronaviruses, there is no long lasting immunity. Yeah. Right. So with every other human coronavirus we've had, um, you are susceptible to getting uh, reinfected by this. So if we are going to have this come back again and again and again, that is by definition endemic, right? So, you know, I should say there are some people with um, MERS that have had uh, immunity for up to 17 years, but that's not even what we're seeing with the preliminary uh, vaccine data where, you know, antibody levels do wear off in some people, um, you know, after uh, 30 or 90 days. So, so, and then, the third step is that even if we did have a vaccine that worked 100% of the time, can we get that to everyone around the world all at the same time? Right. And we haven't been able to do that with polio. You know, polio is eradicatable. Um, um, you know, smallpox was eradicated because you can tell when someone has smallpox, yeah. right? It's not hard to go and tell when someone has smallpox. But, you know, SARS-CoV-2, people are asymptomatic. How can you actually go and track this down, hunt it down and kill it? So fundamentally, this is not an eradicatable illness. It's going to be with us. Yeah. So I think the good if the good example that you mentioned is that there are other viruses that can be eradicated. Like polio is one that I think most people, if you're an American, you think, well, no one gets polio. It doesn't even exist, but it does, right? I mean, that in certain parts of the world, it still exists. And so you have to envision that you're going to have some sort of treatment vaccine that's going to be effective super effective, and you can administer to everybody simultaneously, essentially, so you can have everyone being immune to this, because if you don't, if there's some pocket where it's still around, it's still around, and at some point it can get out. And certainly in our, in, our, in our world now, where we have so much travel and, and commerce, and you know, it's not much to go around the world, as much it might have been a couple hundred years ago. So that's why I look at New Zealand, and I think, well, they're all, it, in some ways, I feel like it's a sort of a fool's errand that they're trying to per keep coronavirus out of their country because, for one thing, I don't think they, I mean, this means they keep themselves locked up in, a, in their island forever, which is an, an impossibility. It's also, you know, it can be economically devastating. Um, but also, there's no guarantee that they don't have it circulating right now. And I think right now, they were went 102 days without any known cases of, of the virus. They've had no travel, I believe, inside and outside the country, outside of just like, you know, stuff that comes in and out and, they, you know, test everybody and quarantine everybody. And yet still they had cases and we're not they're not sure how it happened, whether it was always there and just like people, a few asymptomatic people just spreading to just a couple people, some sheep farmers or something. I don't know. And uh, but it shows how incredibly difficult this would be. And this is and this is also assuming, of course, that there aren't any reservoirs of animals. And just, I think, to make it clear to people that. That, that would mean um, that you, let's say, the like a flu can go back and forth between pigs and humans, right? That's generally the, yeah. So right. so this would say that, you know, we're not, if you're in close proximity to animals, that the an, you can't have the animals. And so you get rid of all humans, and then yet it can still come back because it could be, it's still circulating. It can be a viable disease for animals like bats, like you mentioned with COVID. Yeah. You know, this, this virus is just like water. If there is a crack anywhere, it's going to find a way through there. It's, it's going to find its way back. So, it, you know, and then let's do the thought experiment. Say we put everyone in their house for six weeks, um, and then we said, do not leave your house for six weeks, all around the world, all at the same time. Would that get rid of it? And the answer is no. I mean, it's not going to get rid of it because people probably shed it longer than that. You know, theoretically, they're not contagious after 10 to 20 days, according to more recent evidence. But everywhere all around the world, are we going to obtain perfect um, containment, you know, for any period of time? That, that's why you can't contain this virus. That, that battle was lost back in April when the, when the WHO declared this a yeah. pandemic. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's, it's an important point. I mean, it's imp to imagine locking people up for seven days, much less six weeks, and, and you can... And all it takes is one person who, for whatever reason, that they just aren't able to clear the infection yet, they can get people infected at six weeks plus one day or whatever. I mean, right? That's, that's the whole point.
Right. And then you're back at the start again. You have the contact tracing and whatever, but again, you've got to, you've got to have all that stuff in place. Um, so then it, when it comes to the next steps, I guess uh, you were in your paper, you also wrote in, and I actually had Dr. Gomez on the last episode where we talked about herd immunity. <clears throat> and, you know, I think there are important things to know about herd immunity. I mean, one is it does not mean that it eradicates the disease. It goes away. Herd immunity just simply means that you can't have exponential growth, right? I mean, once you hit this certain point, It'll still exist, it'll still be around, but you're not going to have massive growth, you know, logarithmic growth of the virus or whatever the pathogen that you're talking about. And she suggested uh, that instead of having the traditionally believed to 60 to 80 percent you need of people infected or have some sort of immunity, either for the vaccination or through a prior infection, uh, that you can actually have a herd immunity threshold much, much lower because everyone has different le levels of susceptibility to the virus, whether that's because they've been affected by a similar coronavirus or something else. We don't really know, I guess. Um, but still, you have to get to that 20%. And um, what? how does that actually affect things? And how does that change your view of things now versus when we talked in April? Because I think that that certainly changes my outlook, of the, the sort of the progression than it did then. Yeah, that, that has been a fascinating development um, for me in the last month or two. But, you know, as you were talking with this, this woman, you know, what she's doing is not new, right? She was doing this with tuberculosis and with malaria. Um, it is just that when we were thinking about herd immunity, we were using the wrong model. We were using the model of eradication that we'd get rid of this, not that what we need to do with herd immunity is break the back of the regional epidemics. So that is all herd immunity means is that the regional epidemic ends in your region. It doesn't mean other regions, but in your region, there are not enough people that um, do not have natural immunity through mechanisms we don't understand, who do not have um, cross-reactive immunity from other coronaviruses, who do not have natural immunity from infection and who have not been vaccinated, there's not enough of these people to continue um, with an R not above one. So the epidemic dies, but you still have cases. You're always going to have cases of this. The cases will not go away. Right. And I think that's the important thing to, to recognize that, uh, you know, I think you, you're, we're, there's some of fool's gold, I guess, when you look at New Zealand and you look at these countries that say, we've gotten rid of it. It doesn't exist anymore. And that's true in the sense that it's gone at that moment, but, but it can come back. Right. And, and I think unlike something like Ebola, which is uh, something that is very infectious, but it's, it's not something that's likely to spread worldwide. Right. It's a different sort of virus. You don't have an asymptomatic spreading. It's not, or like even SARS one, right. Where it was pretty obvious when some people are like really sick. And so they're not likely to get massive spreading of it because you can kind of isolate people with this. You really can't. I mean, well, it's like the cold. <laughs> In some ways. Yeah. So exactly. With SARS-1, people weren't contagious until they were very likely in the ICU already. So all you had to do is find someone who's sick as stink, put them in, you know, airborne contact, uh, airborne and, 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 and contact isolation, and you can isolate this out. You know, um, MERS um, doesn't transmit well human to human. It transmits from camels to humans, and we get pinged every now and again, but it just doesn't transmit very well. With SARS-CoV-2, it is the worst of all worlds, is that it's super contagious. It has this asymptomatic phase. Um, it doesn't kill a lot of people, um, so that it is really, but, but yet it doesn't have permanent long-lasting immunity either. So it, it is just going to continue um, to, to eat away at us just bit by bit. Yeah, I mean, it just seems, well, I mean, I guess, you know, in some ways the flu is like that too, right? I mean, it doesn't kill everybody every year, but it comes back. It's a, I know it's a different virus. It's been mutated and stuff, but it's, it's kind of the same sort of thing, right? I mean, it doesn't, a lot, most people get the flu are totally fine and they're, they get over it, but it does take some people for some reason and they, they succumb to it. And I think coronavirus seems similar in that sense, sort of. Well, and let's think about what happens the first time you get a novel zoonotic pandemic version of influenza. It kills a lot of people. And then what happens the second time you get it, you don't get nearly as sick. What happens the third time you get it, you don't get nearly as sick. So that's actually what I'm thinking is going to happen with 
you know, SARS-CoV-2 as we're going to get it. And, and most people aren't sick, unfortunately, with uh, comorbidities, with age, um, with, um, with uh, a social disadvantage. There are issues with morbidity and mortality. But then the second time you get it or if you get a vaccine and then you get it, the, the virus two years later, um, it'll be much more like the common cold. So this this really is this is, you know, evolution from killer to common cold. This is what we're going to see. This is what the science theory tells us is going to happen. We don't need papers to tell us that this is what's going to happen. This this is the inevitable consequence of evolutionary biology. You know, when you're talking about that, I'm trying to I'm trying to see see the see the progression because with with the coronavirus that we have now that are endemic, there are four, I believe. Um, it, it's entirely possible that at one time they were killing lots of people initially when and then it mutated slowly over time into a point where it became more benign. Uh, do you see this as mutating over many years and then it becomes so even with people who have who are you know children now who for whatever reason they get exposed to this coronavirus, then when they first sort of get the coronavirus and, and get it, that they will have a more benign reaction because the virus will have sort of softened by then? Or do you think it's always going to maintain this sort of veracity of, <laughs> of taking people out like it does right now? Right. That That's a su- super interesting question. I, I think we talked briefly last time about evolution towards benignity. And in other RNA viruses like HIV, we actually do see that the population at the population level of the virus there is a change in the genetics thus hiv did mutate from a more virulent form to a less virulent form hiv is interesting because it's not a virus it is a cloud of semi-related pseudoviruses there's such a level of mutation with hiv that there is no hiv that's hiv that's hiv so very easily you can see if one version kills everyone off and the other version leaves you asymptomatic for 10 years to spread it, you know, which version is going to spread. Now with SARS-CoV-2, it's also an RNA virus, but it doesn't have quite the um, messiness and replication that, that HIV has. I don't know that we have to evoke an actual evolution of the virus. The virus doesn't have to change what has to change is people's immunity against it. So that's what's going to happen is right now there are some people that are non-susceptible to this for reasons we don't understand. A lot of kids under five, they just don't get this. Okay. Um, I don't know that we understand that part of it, but then add to that this, this pre-existing cross-related immunity from other coronavirus species, um, But then also, when you get this, your immunity wanes, but you still have memory T cells. You still have some memory of fighting this virus off. When you get it again, it's just not going to be as bad because your immune system is going to kick in. So it's going to evolve to be more benign because its hosts will become relatively And that immunity would also pass down from mother to child as well. Is that right in some level? Well, sure. So if there is some circulating immunoglobulin, um, the um, mom can pass it through the placenta. And then there are some IgAs against this as well. Um, And certainly there are considerations from zero to six weeks um, and from six weeks to six months that are different than, you know, when I say less than five years of age, I should be really careful to point out that that newborns are different with this disease. And um, it's, it's difficult to ever lump a neonate, you know, with a quote, unquote child, let alone a preemie, right? The immune system is vastly different in those groups of people. So I should be careful yeah. to point that out. I always joke with my wife and with any pediatrician that, you know, kids are just little adults. And of course, that's the first line every pediatrics textbook. <laughs> that Kids are not little adults. They're totally different. Let's say we have a vaccine that comes out and um, our guess is... No one knows, but our assumption is that the vaccine won't be 100% effective because almost no vaccine is 100% effective. So if you had a 50% effective vaccine and you wanted to retain, say, 50% herd immunity, you'd need to vaccinate 100% of the people, right? I mean, it's, is that right? Because it, have, it only works half the time. That's assuming no one has any innate immunity uh, to the virus. So uh, 
what what do you see as the the vaccine how the vaccine is going to impact things because well i guess why don't you start there how is the vaccine going to impact the this process of getting to this herd uh, this threshold for herd immunity or will it we get it before a vaccine's ever developed let's say the vaccine comes out next summer you know where we have it widely distributed yeah yeah so i think that is a fascinating question because there are places where 10 to 20 to more percent of people have already had uh, COVID-19. So are there areas in New York and the north of um, Spain that have already reached herd immunity? Uh, And in which case the vaccine wouldn't really be necessary to break the epidemic, then the real question is, are there disease modifying properties to the vaccine? So can I give this to someone who's going to die from COVID-19? Can I give this to someone three months before they're going to die from it and prevent their death? Or, you know, instead of them being in the ICU for four weeks, maybe they're in the ICU for two weeks, or maybe not at all. Um, Maybe they're only in the hospital and maybe they just need oxygen. So I don't know that vaccination is going to participate in herd immunity um, but it may modify the disease. And, and fundamentally, with or without a vaccine, there still is this transitional period where, you know, there's going to be cases, there's going to be disease. And what we need to focus on is what m- mortality during that time. So I, I know it's sad that 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 people are going to die from this. And the real question is looking back you know, three years from now, five years from now, how is the expected mortality um, different because of COVID-19? So um, will the vaccine work in the folks that are at the highest risk for mortality? You know, that that's honestly going to be the question that I'm looking for with, with vaccines. In discussing this too, just think about it now, if you, if you're looking at, our assumption is that people who are young get over this and they actually don't, they don't have, significant morbidity and mortality that we know of I, certainly mortality but morbidity we th- assume there aren't many long you know long range effects that people are um, afflicted with from a pulmonary cardiovascular standpoint we don't know this it'll be years before you actually would know this and whether you could actually figure it out it'd be i think fairly difficult but um but assuming that young people do well would it it almost would make sense in some ways to have a strategy where you say well let's go let's let young people circulate get this get this or um get the vaccine in this case maybe the vaccine but if young people end up getting this more than old people then we'll achieve herd immunity we'll decrease the transmission of this virus and will our mortality rate will significantly drop even though we may have just as many cases we had before and and overall we'll have done better in sort of getting through this than than trying to get herd immunity where while we're using people who are elderly right i mean because I feel like that 20% maybe initially in, say, New York or Spain or northern Italy or Spain might have been reached a lot of times by people who are elderly because we just didn't know. We didn't know to protect people who are in nursing homes. And so that maybe you could hit the same level with a younger population, have the same results, but with way less mortality. Does that seem reasonable? How dare you, Eric? <laughs> um it is entirely reasonable. Reasonable. I mean, let's take college kids and let them do what college kids want to do. You know, let's take them, put them on the campus, you know, shake and stir, leave them there for a couple months. And, and you know, frankly, we should not be doing asymptomatic testing on anyone because those are the people that if there is a benign version of the virus, it's the people that have the asymptomatic disease, you know, that are going to have it. So we should not be it's hard to say because there are always bad consequences occasionally. Like in athletes, we're starting to hear about the rare cardiomyopathy. We hear about the inflammatory syndrome in children. So it's just hard to say, let, you know, let this happen, let people get cases. But, you know, fundamentally, do you want to have this cause a risk factor for the vulnerable folks for the next five years? Or do you want to shorten it up and have it, you know, have uh, nursing homes in their bubble wrap for two years instead of five years. So, you know, yes, we need to, we need to have cases. This is a benign disease for most people, but there's always the caveats and the, the people that are going to hate you for saying that. 
Well, let's look at the United States. I mean, if, when you look compare the United States to most countries in the world, we've done the worst. We, in many ways, have done the worst. Uh, I know there's some small, isolated countries like you know Belgium. Have we? Belgium. Well, I mean, this is the this is the argument made, right? That from a mortality standpoint, the United States, and from a case standpoint, the United States is way worse than than many countries in Europe and you know Asia. Right. And and who has been making those arguments, Eric? It's been the media. And what has the media done for this? I mean, the media has been the worst part of this outbreak. They've caused more death and disease than than the damn virus has. So, you know, and I, I don't like saying we've done the worst, have we? Because we might be closer to being done with this than everyone else that's done better than us. So I don't think we can say what's good or bad now. We have to look back three three years from now and say, you know, who had less morbidity, who had less you know, certainly we don't want to overwhelm our healthcare systems, right? Given. Certainly we want to protect our vulnerable people. But after that, if you have, you know, 25 cases per 100,000, you know, rather than five cases per 100,000, what, what's wrong with that? Why is that a problem? Why is that bad? Yeah, I, and I wasn't actually going to make, uh, disagree with that, except to point out that, you know, when you look at the numbers, the United States is much different than, let's say, let's just compare it to New Zealand, because I think, you know, everyone's holding up New Zealand as, the ideal sort of containment strategy for COVID-19. Uh, again, sort of along your point, what is the how does the ending look for both countries? I mean, it, are we looking at the same amount of people have to get get uh, you know get it? I mean, you're still going to have to have 20% of New Zealanders get COVID at some point, or is it is it reasonable to say if we had a vaccine, let's say by summer where it's widely distributed or maybe even spring let's be super optimistic that we have a very effective vaccine available by spring that that would be the way around because that's sort of the argument right like if you if we we want to hold off as long as we can in order to get to a point where there's a vaccine and once we get the vaccine and we massively distribute it we get it to 80 percent people take some vaccine that's you know let's say 50 percent effective which would give us a herd immunity 40 percent let's say right uh, which should according to you know some of these models that would be adequate in most areas to get you to the point where you at least don't have exponential growth. You still have COVID, but not as much. Uh, would it then be, would it then be seen as wise what New Zealand has done versus what the United States where, you know, where we've sort of taken on the chin at this, at least initially. And tell me, do you think you could get Americans to do <laughs> what they have done in New Zealand? No. So, you know, we, we have to deal with the facts as they are on the ground um, you know, if I could wave my wand and figure out how to get people to behave, well, then I might work on obesity. I might work on smoking. <laughs> I might work on diabetes. I might work on our, you know, disparate healthcare system that the reason why we have so many underserved people in this country, you know, those are the reasons why people are dying is because we have really sick people. New Zealand doesn't have sick people like we do. Moreover, let's look at the next step. So say that you do vaccinate all of New Zealand. It's really only, you know, what is it, 30% of those 75 and older that are dying from this, right? It's folks in the nursing home that are causing a lot of the excess mortality now. So are those folks going to respond to a vaccine? You know, the, folk, the very folks that are going to die from this, are they going to respond to a vaccine or are they going to live in bubble wrap for the next five years? And is that living? Because it's not, even if we vaccinate everyone in New Zealand, there's still going to be cases. It's not going away. You're going to get this. Yeah, and I think that's probably the important point, right, to recognize that even if you vaccinate, you're not going to have 100% effectiveness. Most vaccines don't work well for the elderly, right? I mean, it's better than nothing, like you're getting the the, uh, the flu shot for the elderly. But you to help the elderly the most, you need young people getting the flu shot, especially kids, right? The ones who are the biggest vectors for flu when it comes to spreading spreading flu, uh, and going to see grandpa or whatever. This is like a thought experiment in many ways or discussion because we're op all operating in the fog of war. We don't really know how this virus works. We don't know how, I mean, there's so much that is unknown about it. Uh, and I think there's so much fear that is clickbait <laughs> for, for both the media and for politicians. I think certainly they enjoy exerting control or at least being in charge of and feel and to the impression that they have this thing under control or that they, there's this ability to get it under control. And that certainly their opponents, if in a point, uh, at least we'll point out with politicians, that their opponents are opposed to that or they're uh, embarking upon the wrong strategy, depending whatever side you're on in this sort of, you know, battle. 
what, how do we move for the next year? I mean, how do you think this really is going to play out? Because, I mean, my feeling is if, let's say, we've hit herd immunity in a number of these cities, like New York and other places, I feel like people aren't going to accept the fact that we've hit a herd immunity. And they're not going to be, they're not going to accept the fact that you could reopen things until there's a vaccine, whether the vaccine actually makes a big difference in the whole, you know, process or not. Do you, do you agree with that, that thought? So absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm actually, dare I say, considering writing a book about the transitional phase. So, so getting from epidemic to endemic, how do we get through there? We get through there during this two to five year transitional phase. And, you know, with the vaccine, without a vaccine, with a treatment, without a treatment, we're going to go through this. Um, there is going to be a time where we're in transition from these great epidemics that might cripple our healthcare system to, eh, I've had this twice before, I'm going to be fine now. So what is the world like between those times? Well, well let, me, let me give you my top three list. We've, we've already bashed the media, but I, I just don't know that you can, can give them as enough credit for the horrible job they've done <laughs> covering this. I mean, they've, they've incited panic. They've talked about the wrong thing. They've said certain places are bad, certain places are good. So, but close after the media, Eric, are politicians. And, and let's be honest, I mean, politicians make political decisions. This isn't a Democratic thing. This isn't a Republican thing. They're all horrific. They're all trying to do the thing that gets them reelected rather than the right thing for people. So, you know, maybe this will improve after November 3rd when there's less pressure to be elected immediately. But, I mean, politicians yeah. are politicians, right? This is never going to get better. So let's shoot all the media, shoot all the politicians. And then number three, the scientists. Scientists have left us down on this. They have, there has been such a rush to publication that the garbage going out in the Journal of Mid-Aged Hand <laughs> Art has been about COVID-19 without any editorial you know, control. So there are papers out there that should never be published. There are papers out there that are retracted all the time. Something like 80% of the case reports are from China, you know, which has less than, you know, 0.6% of all the cases. So scientists have, they haven't stayed in their lane. They have, they have been making prognostications about this, largely by what they hear from politicians and the news media. And, and if we can get rid of scientists, that might help well, us too. I thought we we're supposed to follow the science, David. You know, we're supposed to, <laughs> we're supposed to, that's where we're making all educated guesses, right? Well, and that's exactly why I want to do this thought experiment just based upon, you know, science theory. What can we conclude? And, and we can conclude that the epidemic will end, this will become endemic, and something will happen in between. So what will happen in between? That, that's a fascinating question. To me. Yeah, and I guess, you know, it, in this case, probably depends where you are, right? I mean, uh, you know, if you're in New Zealand, it's going to be a lot different pathway than it is the United States versus China or Russia. Or let's, you know, stop talking about rich countries. Let's talk about a country like Congo. I mean, they have no resources, right? And so they have, and as far as we can tell, they're just as susceptible to it as any other place in the world. I mean, it seems to be... <laughs> In non-discriminatory, I, you know, maybe with outcomes, it's different. It's certainly we've noticed that in the United States, but as far as people getting infected, it doesn't seem to really matter where you live that I can tell. Yeah, no, and I, I haven't paid enough attention to Africa, but it seems like they're getting by for, for not having um, physical spacing, for not having the ability to stay away from people and having no resources. Uh, I mean, the, the continent is not being decimated. So there might be more to, to know there too, but I, I'm yeah, not I, speak about all I that. know is I talked to someone from South Africa who has a some property in South Africa and says, well, you know, they can't even get oxygen, um, you know, because they have limited supply, and that's probably one of the richer countries in the certainly in the the southern uh, part of Africa, the subcontinent. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting looking back, and and I w I worry that that we're not going to in many ways learn much with this whole thing. And I think people always say, well, we can look back and we'll figure out, you know, what was right, what was wrong. But I, the nature, human nature is whatever I did was the right course of action. And had I not done whatever X, Y, Z is, then it would have been so much worse, right? Whatever your, whatever your thoughts were on policy, whether shutting things down, not doing anything. And that sort of brings me to like, I think Sweden's a really interesting 
case because that's always used because it's a Western country. It's very had a very different policy generally, as far as I can tell, from the rest of Europe and from the Western world. And it seems right, right and they were bad. bad. And, you know, you can look at it and you can say, well, they have way more deaths than their Nordic neighbors. Uh, their policies were very different, and they seem to have way worse outcomes. They all seem to kind of hit this decreased transmission that this sort of the problems with COVID seem to be about the same in all the countries. And yet Sweden had what, a lot more cases probably and a lot more deaths. So maybe you could say that they were worse, right? Or, or would you suggest that it's, it, this story has not been fully written yet for Denmark and Norway and Finland? So again, if, if you're going to have 30% of the 70 year old plus crowd die from this, how are you going to prevent that in the next two to three years? So I, I'll, I'll tell you, tell me the story of Sweden three to five years from now and tell me if they did a bad job. I don't know that you're yeah, going to find well, what they did. We need to know our answers right now because three years from now, is you know, that's not how we operate. <laughs> but yeah, you're right, absolutely right. And that's and that's the problem, yeah. right? Because it's so much speculation. And, uh, you know, I think it was, I was reading an article on it, University of North Carolina, This and we're recording this uh, August 17th, uh, 2020. University of North Carolina just shut down their classes, their in, in-person classes, because they've had outbreaks on campus, which is not surprising, because I don't think there's been a huge problem in North Carolina to begin with, and I imagine most of the kids there are from North Carolina. Um, and then the, the mention that then the, the same article they talk about herd immunity needed to get 68 percent. Well, only two percent of Americans, I think they said, which I think is very low, but they said two percent of Americans have had it. We've had 160 thousand deaths. If you project that out to 60 percent of people who are getting, which you know, so 160 thousand times 30 is I uh, was it like six, five million people or something like that. Try to math quick um, or four and a half million. That's, you know, unacceptable death rate, which I agree. That's pretty bad. But I, I think, you know, in some ways, would it be safe to say that the people who have died so far are the most likely to have to die from this and that the people who are less likely to die will get it. will you know, that they're they will get it later, I guess, is sort of or they'll. So the mortality rate will go down naturally because the, mo- the frailest of us have already succumbed to it because they're more susceptible and likely to die. A couple things about that is that there are no risk-free choices with this. A- and I think that's also a fallacy that people don't understand. You know, every time you get in a car, there's risk. Every time you put someone under anesthesia, there's risk. The thing is, is that these are known risks. We've been, we've known about them forever and we tolerate them. You know, being in the car, as you know, Eric, can be, can be a terrifying event. And just like someone who has had a family member die from COVID, that colors the way they view this and that colors the way they view risk, right? So it's pretty easy in my armchair to talk about the number of people that have died from this and they're going to die anyway. And it doesn't sound sympathetic, but, but there, but we have to live our life. There's no alternative. There are no risk-free options. Whatever we do involves risk. If we let kids go to college, there's risk. If we let them don't go to college, there's risk. So I think when you look back on this three to five years from now, there's going to be a certain mortality rate. And whether you're good, bad, or other, your mortality rate's going to be about the same. Because again, it's those 30% of people that, that are going to die from this, they're going to get exposed at some point. We can't bubble wrap them. You know, will a vaccine prevent them? Prevent them from dying? Right. And so you're almost looking at the vaccine as a therapeutic measure, right? Because I feel like I've had the vac, I've been vaccinated for flu and I know there are number strains they have to sort of guess, but when I'm, I will get the flu still, <laughs> I've gotten it and I don't get quite as sick as people who haven't been vaccinated, you know, and yet they, they're sick for like weeks and I get sick for a couple of days and feel terrible, but I'm, you know, no worse for the wear, I guess in the end. Yeah. So d- disease modification is kind of the best that we can hope for. The other argument right now is that people say, well, I, you know, Along to your point is there. What's the point of living if I have to live hidden away in a, you know in a cave? And I saw someone mention somewhere you know why would you send your kid who's immunocompromised to school because you know all this is going around because they've had a transplant let's say and then of course the response is well the reason they had a transplant is so they could live <laughs> recognizing that of course there are risks in life I mean you you don't take 
you don't go skydiving without a parachute, but uh, you also have to, you know, get an airplane occasionally. And so what, what do you think, what do you think about that? It's sort of like people want to go say the most important thing in their life is performing, singing, uh, you know, whatever. Can you tell someone to not ever do that again for two, three years? I mean, I look at my son, he's a, he's a, in a choir. Well, once he, in a couple, you know, probably less than a year, his voice will change and his career as far as a boy sing, you know, choir, choral singer is over forever. And I mean, what, how do you, how do you address those pe- people and tell them like, you know, no sports or whatever. I mean, there's lots of things where you can congregate and do things that are important for life. And that's why we live. Yeah. And, and, you know, which is why we live in a country with 50 different states, 50 different ways of pursuing this problem. Because, you know, if, if we knew what the right answer was, we, we could tell you, but we don't. So when the shelter in place order ended, thus then began individual responsibility, right? That became um, the time that we were to take upon our shoulders the decision that, you know, inherent in life, there is risk. Um, as you like to say, life is right. a terminal disease, right? Right. So, you know, last time we talked, Eric, I, you said I depressed you. Am, am I depressing you this time too, or, 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 or are we doing no, better? No, no, I don't think so. No, I think, I think we're better. I, I mean, I think partly, so I will tell you this, this totally has nothing to do with this, but I, as someone who has been, as people listen to the show, they know that my son died almost exactly two years ago now in a car accident. And, um, and that's at the end of the show is him singing a solo at a Christmas um, performance the year before. And, and I would tell you as someone who is grieving because it's a long process, you know, you're always sort of grieving for a while. It is, it was, this, it was really tough when all you talk about and you're talking about is people dying. I mean, that's, and I can see why like suicides go up. I can see why people have so much difficulty dealing with this and there's anxieties worse and depression. I mean, I can, I get that more than I would have before. And, and so I think, you know, our discussion where you said, well, you're not gonna be able to do, you know, go to sporting events and doing things because I'm thinking to myself, well, I've got my son, my, you know, my only living son. Now I've got him for about four or five more years. One of the things we do is go to Michigan State basketball games. And I can't imagine him like not doing that again until he's like in college when I miss that opportunity, because there aren't a lot of things that we do together as a family that are like important. That's one thing that's kind of important. And it may seem silly to some people and not important, but it's important to us. Right. And to have that taken away is hard. And so I think, you know, people look at this and say, well, screw that. I don't want that taken away. I don't want to not see my grandkids for three years or whatever. Right. I mean, there, there are things that, you know, I, that are just hard to give up because that's what life is. You have, to, like you said, there's risks you take. And, and so I felt like at that time we talked, it, you know, maybe it was like, well, there's nothing you do about it. You have to not do that, those things. But I'm at least encouraged and hopeful when I hear that people are not susceptible as we thought in some ways. And the fact that herd immunity is not going to require some astronomical number that we're not going to be able to reach within you know, five years. No, I agree. There's There's been nothing but good news since then. And then, you know, look at the NBA and what they've been able to do. I mean, they, they have 400 people there in a bubble. And have they had any new cases? So, you know, there there are ways to do things. There are ways to mitigate your risk. But again, you know, you, you don't want to lose your humanity in the process of, of mitigating risks. Yeah. And I think that's, the answer is there's, it's, you, you would hope that people could take individual responsibility and, and individual action to sort of assess risk. It's hard because I understand this is not like, it's not like a, the risk is only to you. There's obviously risk to others. And so that's the, that's the that's the hard part to try and calculate. I mean, we're really bad as human beings at calculating risk anyway. For me trying to tell people what the risk of, you know, anesthesia or any sort of complications of things, I have to try and put it into something that they feel that they understand. Like, you know, the risk is you're probably greater risk for not making it to the hospital, making home than to actually have some problem with the anesthetic that's significant. And that people, people are like, Oh, okay, well that makes some sense to them. But again, it's like, we're not really good at it, and you watch images on TV and or in the newspaper or on the internet, and then it gives you a completely completely skewed idea of what risk is, and then you have your you know your bias, whatever it might be. Like I don't like lockdowns, or I think are great, and so that sort of skews what you think is should be the course of action. What do you see for us then, for the next 
let's just, I don't know what a reasonable projection is. Where do you think we're going to be in December? I mean, it, assuming there's no conspiracy, like the election is, as soon as, you know, let's say Biden wins and then, oh, then suddenly the virus is gone, right? I mean, I think those conspiracy theories are kind of silly. <laughs> but what do you, what do you see the, what do you see the United States as? Because that's all we really care about since we're U.S. based pockets. Right. What do you see the United States in December? Yeah, I, I think you're looking at it. I, I cannot foresee anything that's going to happen anytime soon that changes anything that's going on right now. So because here's the thing is there's always going to be cases. And, and how many cases do you tolerate? How many times do you need to shut down school before you stop shutting down school? So the great unknown is the you know, flu and respiratory season. And interestingly, if you look at Australian data, they really haven't had any cases. You know, it's winter down there and they haven't had a flu season. So is it possible that our physical distancing, our masks, our hand washing will um, make the flu season not the ginormous uh, risk that we think it's going to be? You know, that would be nice. I'm not planning for it, but... But what do I see this December? What do I see next December? What do I see, see the December after? It, is, there's nothing going to be different, Eric. This, this is going to be a slow process, a transition um, to when you are able to understand the risk of this is just the common cold. But we're still going to have people vulnerable. We're still going to have people dying from this for, for a long time. So how about that for optimistic? I, I don't think there's going to be any difference. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's generally good because most places are not, it's not being overwhelmed with hospitals aren't being overrun. And even I feel like places where there are outbreaks, they're fairly, they're fairly short bursts. I mean, you look at Arizona, Texas, Florida, certain cities, which are the most recent ones, California, another one, that it is a big, huge burst. And then it kind of just fades away after a few weeks. And, you could say, well, that's because everyone locked down and they, they hid it and stuff. But I don't think that's probably. I don't. Maybe that mitigated things and changed things. But I don't think you'd have such dramatic sort of ends to these sort of mini regional outbreaks if it was just the fact that people just started being more careful. I think it. I think the virus sort of burns out quickly, but it's still there and that like a low level, like a burn, like you say. Yeah, and, and again, the interesting thing will be to see what happens in New York City now. Are they going to have another wave? Or, you know, is Florida going to have another wave now? Or are they good for a while? So, you know, eventually we're going to break the back of these epidemics regionally, and, and we're just going to have cases here and there. It's going to be little embers burning sporadically in the forest rather than a conflagration burning the whole thing down. And that's frankly what we want. That's where we want to be. Yeah. Well, and I think I think when it comes to the virus, there's the we see how the end is probably going to be. I mean, the hard thing is the hard thing for me to, to wrap my head around is how politically do we get to a point where we are comfortable with the disease being around and that people are still getting it and that we don't have, you know, a headline saying 50 percent increase in Traverse City, which means instead of 10 cases, they have 15. Right. <laughs> and that, you know, people stop freaking out about freaking out about it and feeling that they have to have extraordinary means and measures in order to prevent, you know, the next wave or whatever it is when potentially it's just a couple, you know, a family gets it or something. I mean, it's, you know, that's the, that's the hard thing that I don't, I don't know how easily some of these, some of these officials, whether they're health officials or politicians give up and sort of like say, okay, because, you know, if you look at Michigan, Michigan's phase six, and there, which is the phase where, like, basically totally fine. If we get to phase six, it means that coronavirus doesn't exist. Well, I can guarantee you, <laughs> well, as much as I could guarantee anything, that we'll never reach phase six. So does that mean we're always going to be in a state of emergency? You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. And, and it's like the, um, the, the woman doctor you had on the other, other day said about um, these public health people, is they, they won't let go of this. They're always going to make this seem like a horrific um, event. So, and, you know, regarding politicians, there's this, this great Winston Churchill quote that Americans will always do the right thing after they have um, done everything else possible and, and exhausted failed, right? all other possibilities. Yeah. Right. There, thank you. I, I knew it was out there somewhere. So, so <laughs> I, I just don't think we're going to be able to exhaust all the other possibilities with this, Eric. We're never going to do the right thing. We're going to keep trying everything else. 
So that that's how the COVID-19 will end with us trying something else. Yeah. Well, my hope is that that won't be sooner rather than later because um, I, I can't tell you how many times I say dumb virus in a day. My, my patients watch me enter the room with more and more <laughs> useless uh, protective equipment, you know, like wearing glasses, which I don't think there's any, you know, I'm putting glasses on top of my glasses. I mean, we're wearing goggles now. I, I know when we talked before, you said, well, there are probably protective measures that we're going to have that are probably just going to be with us forever. And there's probably some truth to that. And I can see a utility to that, especially with, like the flu season. It'd be much more sensible for us to have all this stuff on during flu season or, you know, when there's an epidemic. Well, we don't worry about the flu, but an epidemic, the flu is an epidemic, right? I mean, it's usually a regional epidemic and then it kind of burns itself out after a little while. Yeah, well, yeah, when when you get a, a change like the 1918 virus coming back again in 2008 and causing a little bit of a of a stir, you know, things change for a little while. And, um, and, and you know, it's funny that during influenza season, we should have been doing all of these PPE things before, Eric. We should have been wearing masks and eye protection, and it was never important to us. So, so you know, 10 years from now when COVID is the common cold, again, how important will it be for us? Yeah. Well, and maybe it's a, maybe it's a good survival mechanism that humans have a short memory because maybe, you know, if you, you know, I mean, that, that may be somewhat protective. Otherwise you can, you know, living in fear is not healthy <laughs> from a health standpoint. That's right. And, and the fatigue that goes along with this pandemic, man, it, it, it is, it is tough to deal with day after day after day for everyone. How How is it specifically just for you? I mean, is, you're infectious disease, so I'm sure people are asking you this all the time. And I mean, a lot of, I mean, I feel like infectious disease is just like what antibiotic you use is usually the, <laughs> the question you probably deal with more than anything. But uh, what do you, what's your role been in the hospital with this and, is for an ID specialist? Well, and, and you know, I think there's going to be as many answers to that as there are um, healthcare systems. So, and and all of us are so different. You know, I'm, I'm a big picture kind of person. So I, I really appreciate I've had the time to, to think about these bigger things to be administrative. So my clinical duties have, um, have uh, gone down quite a bit. And I am able to look regionally and locally at what's going on and, and try to try to help out, you know, my community. Um, um, advising schools, advising colleges, advising churches, not just, you know, banging out the antibiotic stewardship, which is apparently all we do, according to anesthesiologists. All you do is gas people. So I, <laughs> you know, I, I, I misunderstand what you do too, right? So I, I don't actually um, deny but, that. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but yeah, this, this, this is, I mean, this is a one in a hundred year pandemic of an infectious disease. How, how can it not blow the mind of every infectious disease doctor out there? Um, but, you know, that said, there's a lot of people banging their head against the the desk, just looking at the next study, the next study, the next study. There's a lot of academic infectious disease doctors that have been pretty useless in the course of this. Because again, they're looking for the data to guide them and the data sucks. Be honest, the data has sucked. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, and I think this is, in some ways, it kind of, it does relate to viral, I mean, viral treatments are not very good, right? I mean, we don't have very good treatments for any virus. HIV has been very successful. I think, you know, the treatment for HIV, you don't get rid of the virus. You just get to, you, you prevent all the secondary infections, but, and you keep the viral load very low. And that's been probably the most successful viral sort of strategy outside of vaccinations, which, you know, prevent virus, the initial infection. But I feel like right. that's been the biggest success of anything, right, for viruses. Right. And, and the difficulty is, is that viruses aren't alive, right? So how do you kill something that isn't alive? Well, viruses <laughs> use your cells to replicate. So you have to kill you to kill the virus. And, and really what allowed us to get a handle on HIV is it is a pretty complicated virus um, with these proteases with um mechanisms of latching on and breaking off that gave us these targets but really fundamentally it was killing people that's why we developed therapies against it we actually have treatments that work against the common cold but what side effects will you tolerate to take a medicine that makes your common cold better right right so what safety profile do you need to have to make something that's going to go away on its own better 
So, you know, virus medicines for viruses have been difficult. Um, you know, give us enough reason to develop medicines. We'll develop medicines, but that may work while people are sick in the ICU. But when this is a common cold, is anyone going to need it or take it? Yeah, well, that's and that's going to be the challenge, right? To There's so many challenges with this, but I mean, that's certainly we'll add that to the list of things that are going to make it complicated. Well, I really appreciate the time. Um, I've I've learned something. I hope the listeners have learned something, too. And I think, you know, the, the takeaways, of course, we're not going to eradicate this disease, this virus. It's still going to be around. It's going to be with us. But at some point, we merge the other end and how we get there is, you know, and, and what sort of steps we take are going to are going to sort of vary hopefully we can talk in a couple months or something's changed or there, you know when vaccines start coming online and we see what's happening I mean, we've russia decided to, to do phase three trials just by releasing a vaccine <laughs> to its population which is unprecedented i don't think anyone's done that but i guess it pays to be authoritarian you can do whatever you want yeah. but well and i think the other conclusion eric is that we need to, need to get rid of all the media uh, all the politicians, all the scientists, and especially the <laughs> anesthesiologists and ID docs, the world would be a better place without them. I've always found that the, the it, it, now infectious disease does not have an ology, right? Is there? There's no other term for infectious disease. It's like everyone's just you're just ID, right? Yeah, there's like, you immuno, know, you're not an immunologist. You're. I'm the infection doctor. I'm the last person people want to see. No one wants to come to my clinic. I don't know why that is. Well, I'd argue that pathologists may be uh, maybe a. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be least, worse. less yeah. desirable than you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but anyway, it was it was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, if you want to catch up with more uh, for with Dr. David Graham, you can go to fiphysician.com. dot uh, com. The paper for that he wrote, and actually your blogs, and and all the probably two thirds what you write is actually on finances for physicians and retirement and things like that. And so that can all be found at that website. That will be linked at the show notes page at theparadox dot com slash zero ninety six. Uh, there you can also find our previous episodes we discussed and other things I've talked about COVID because, you know, who's had enough COVID-19, right? Everyone wants to talk about it even more. But sadly, everyone really wants to talk about it. So that's why we're here talking about it. And, and it's been a fun puzzle in, in a morbid sort of way, but it's been sort of trying to figure out how things work because I think it's something none of us have seen and hopefully, God forbid, we ever see again. So, Dr. Graham, thanks so much for being with me today. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for listening to The Paradox. If you like what The Doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And share the show with your friends. Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash theparadox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com.